this is the second time that this group of data and closure enthusiasts are meeting to talk about natural language processing. So um, yeah, hello, thanks for joining us. And maybe since there's only a few people here, we could do just a really brief intro, go around and explain basically just like, you know, 30 seconds who you are and why you're here. Um, so I can start, I'm Kira, uh, I'm a software developer. I do mostly web development, but uh, happened to stumble into a job doing web development for an open data publishing company, which kind of led me into this world of uh, working with data. And now I'm working on a project to um, create educational resources for the closure data community. So a kind of cookbook of examples um, that will hopefully serve as like a reference for how to combine all of the different libraries. So something that could be um, added to on top of all the really excellent API docs that already exist for people who are looking to just like solve a problem. So um, very similar to like the R cookbook, if you've ever read that or the Python cookbook, um, but for closure and the Cyclosure ecosystem and all of the new libraries that have come up in the last year or two. So that's um, something that's currently underway and uh, slowly, slowly chipping away at it. Um, I guess usually the way I've seen this work well is if everyone just wants to pick the next person because everybody's arranged differently on everyone's screen. So um, I'll nominate Karsten. Yes, yes hello. Uh, my name is Karsten Bere. I'm a data scientist. I have a background as a, a software engineer and I try to, to do my duties as data scientist uh, using as much uh, closure as possible. So I'm very much interested in the machine learning aspect, uh, but as well interoperability, visual tools as well, to, to uh, which allows me to do my, my job uh, a lot of times uh, using closure. And I'm very happy to contribute uh, to, to increase that percentage because closure is a fantastic language. Thank you. Wonderful. And yeah, we're lucky to have you. So for those who don't know, Carson is the author of several uh, really excellent libraries in the Cyclosh ecosystem. So I'm sure those uh, some of those will come up today. So yeah, go ahead. Yes, the next, I don't know, who's the next? Um, you can pick anyone who hasn't gone yet. Okay, uh, Ian, Ian Wood. Hi, I'm Ian. Um, I Ian. work with Clojure, I work for Flexiana uh, and uh, work with a, a, a few different teams programming mostly in Clojure. Um, but occasionally in other languages and that's what attracted me to tonight's session it's like integrating what do we, what do you say connecting closure and python um and that's a current problem that we are facing uh, i'd like to know more about that personally i have a great interest in the way that uh, closure is taught and um i have this this strong feeling that if closure was taught earlier uh, it would be of great benefit to both the closure community and the students that are fresh learning programming. Uh, and that's something that I want to explore more of. And I kind of like the the visual side of the um, um, data science aspect of it. So combining that and closure, it's like uh, eh, interested in lots of different directions that all kind of meet up with what's going on here. I'm going to nominate Ash. <clears throat> Hello, I'm Ash. Um, my background is software engineering. I'm working in a research, a university research project in Scotland. And this research project is to do with um, basically creating a recommender system that's going to help people going to help recommend uh, treatment pathways to try to rehabilitate people, getting back into work, getting back into society. And we're working with a, a data set um, from a, an Icelandic corporation um, and we're using some machine learning um, and I'm interested in closure. I'm interested in DVC and I'm glad to be here. That's me. Nice. Welcome. Oh, um, I'll, I'll nominate someone. Um, I'll nominate uh, Tony, please. Hello, I'm I, I think you met me. So I'm Tori Anderson and I am a um, web development engineer at a university, and I spend a lot of time training students in Clojure. So I I'm a definite believer in teaching students. And uh, my background is in natural language processing, and I'm currently doing research in 
control theory as well. So that's the data science plug there. So um, Clojure is great. I've been using that for a while. Awesome. I think we've got a couple people. Um, can I nominate, uh, sorry for the pronunciation, um, Joao, wow, Joao, John? Yeah. Santiago is usually, it's easier for everyone. Let's go by Santiago. Okay. Santiago is easier, yeah. yeah. Um, so that's me, uh, Santiago. I've, um, I'm working in the, in the anti-fraud team of a fintech in Berlin. Uh, so my, my daily job is mostly data science, just doing algorithms for fraud models um, in real time and so on. Uh, we use mostly R, uh, but uh, for some of the tasks, like I was saying before uh, in our pipeline, we did have some closure involved. And now I'm actually building my team up with closure, not from data science out, but from the engineering in. So we are everything related to model deployment, model uh, operations, model registries, and so on, model alerting, everything is being done in closure. Um, and so we are slowly building the team there. Otherwise, I've only been using closure um, you know, as a for side projects and hobbies and stuff. And I'm actively trying to change that. Um, it's a good way, like trying to sneak it in the back door. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> nobody stops you, right? So just keep yeah. doing it until someone says you're doing something that wrong. It works. It works. It works. Yeah. Um, I guess uh, Uli. Yes. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Uli Shech. Uh, I work on a probabilistic database system called Inference QL, um, where the idea is that you know, by implementing a language like SQL, you sort of like empower uh, uh, users to apply data science that currently don't have access to it because Python programming or Clojure programming is too hard. Um, that system is implemented in both Clojure and, um, and Python. Um, what brings me here in particular is um, while I don't know anything about natural language processing, uh, we part of our um, database system is an automated data modeling component that is built with Clojure, Python, and DVC. So I figured coming here, I might learn something. Uh, so I'm very much looking forward. Um, uh, who hasn't gone? Uh, Daniel, did you, I mean, I don't know. Did, did you introduce uh, yourself yet? Like a quiz, who's paying attention? Oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah, I yeah. fail. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, I'm Daniel. I do statistics mostly. I'm a statistician, but recently at my day job, I did have to do some natural language processing, and it is so much different from what it used to be. And I'm so much overwhelmed by new ideas, and the people around me are teaching me a lot. And yeah, we did have a little bit of opportunity to use DVC, and it was delightful. And you know, uh, since cast and blog post about it a few one a couple of months ago, I'm I've been really waiting for this talk and so excited about it happening today. And uh, Blaine, uh... hi, <clears throat> I'm uh, Blaine Moores. I'm a uh, a, a protein crystallographer at, at um, a university, and uh, my lab uses uh, Python and uh, uh, to uh, do all kinds of things. In structural biology, um, but uh, in structural biology, there is essentially uh, very little use, as far as I know, of closure. And uh, I was introduced to closure by the work series of workshops that were put on, uh, hosted by Daniel last fall. And uh, I have, over the past year, been working on trying to pick up closure a bit, but mostly just trying to uh, adapt to using Emacs. <laughs> Is my main uh, editor, or uh, well, not editor, computing environment. <laughs> um, so, um, but so I've lagged a little bit um, uh, spinning up with closure. But I was attracted to the fact that we're you know, today. There's going to be discussions about uh, interface between Python and uh, closure. That sounds very interesting to me. Yeah. I think we've got a couple new people, uh, Max and Robert. Hi, guys. Um, if you would like, we're just at the tail end of doing some quick intros, um, totally optional. 
Um, okay, anyway, we will carry on with maybe um, a brief intro about today's topics from uh, Karsten. So we're going to learn about, um, yeah, basically connecting Clojure with Python and um, DBC, which basically all I know about it is a sort of um, like version control system for pipelines or for machine learning models or something like this. So Carson's going to give us a little overview and then we'll get into some more details and have some time for discussion. So I'll uh, hand it over to you. Thanks so much, Carson. So thank you. I want to talk about Python closure interop uh, using DVC, uh, the data version control. A little bit the agenda, just three points. Closure, very short, uh, closure for data science. Uh, then DVC, uh, the two use DVC for model training, and then a little bit of a comparison because we have in DVC a, a concept of pipelines, and uh, some of you have looked at Ski Closure Metamorph. There's another concept of pipelines, and just to contrast a little bit uh, the two. Please interrupt me at any moment. I cannot uh, see a hand raised or something, so please interrupt me directly if you have any questions or, or comments. Okay. Um, closure for data science. Um, but I want to, the, the message I want to bring here is that in, in data science that in general relies on a very fast evolving universe of existing models and algorithms. A big part of that is rooted in academia still. Uh, Python and R dominate the field uh, since years and that will not change a lot. There's now Java there, but uh, it, it's uh, clearly third class. Maybe Julia comes now, but we talk about uh, other languages uh, than the GVM, which are prominent. Uh, as I said, uh, I think as a data scientist, we have this view on the world a little bit that, that we want to follow what, what others do, because there are a lot of things uh, regarding models and algorithms is that you cannot really know if it's working unless you have tried it with your own data. Uh, so that means that we want part of our job is to basically Google for people who have sim similar problems to us, have a look what, how they have solved the problem, and that is then the next try. And we repeat until we gave up or, or we have a good, have a good enough uh, solution. So there is somehow lots of trial and error. We are copy-paste uh, what other people have done. Um, and that means interop is somehow a must, uh, because if I find a paper which ex expresses more or less the same problem and the solution which I have, and it uses Python, then I don't want to spend time in rewriting the pattern library they have using used in closure only to find out that it will probably that it does not work anyway because 80 percent of the things we try they don't work so we need to be fast there and fast can only mean to reuse uh, what others have done so clearly in a niche language such such as uh, uh, closure interop is a must for, for for data science in my point of view so we just uh, cannot say we don't want to do it we just need to find the ways how to do it uh, there are two ways of interop. Um, there is one way which I call in-process interop. So that means that in some form we have a, a really an interop library, uh, which for the case of Python and, and R are called libpython, uh, CAJ, and closures R. So basically there you write uh, closure code and behind the scenes it gets transformed into Python or R codes in, in that form. So it, I call it in process, maybe it's even technically the right word, but you write at the end only kind of closure. Both are very compatible, but not 100%. In the sense of, even though that they, that libpython, for example, is using a Python process and closures R is using an R process, they do things differently than the majority of other people are doing. Because, so it's a little bit of a different runtime. They are very compatible, not 100%. I would call them 99% uh, uh, compatible, but they are different runtimes. And they are far less tested. They are, nobody tests any Java or Python library with libpython, cdj, or closures R. They get tested with Python and R. Uh, so there are certain areas of issues which I have as well experienced, instabilities. The moment it goes to multi-core, parallel, GPU, long-running calculations, there we could expect uh, uh, issues to, uh, to a certain level to, to appear. So it's good to have a plan B. 
The plan B is uh, just to have have something to do the moment we fall in these uh, one percent of things which are not working, and there DVC uh, uh, plays in. Maybe now uh, we can get uh, 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 Joan uh, with a little introduction more of uh, DVC, if you agree. Yeah, I can show you what I have. <clears throat> yeah. yeah. So I stopped sharing, yeah. Cool, so um, the, the first thing I would like, I'm gonna show you is a, um, a library I wrote to, for interacting between DVC and R because it has a couple of examples already just to show how this is used in practice. And I think seeing an example of how it's used, you can also understand like why would you use this in the first place and why what Carson is saying makes so much sense. Um, we originally wanted to use DVC because of these um, version control aspects of it. I mean, the whole tool is called data version control, DVC. Um, but in the end, it's a lot more. And I actually, what I use the most is the other part that is not data version control, so, so to speak. So DVC has two big components. It has this data version control part, but it also has this pipelining part. Um, and as, as you will see, like most everything in data science is about DAGs. You have graphs everywhere. You have things that are dependent on other things and steps that depend on previous steps, um, which I guess for a lot of us doing closure, it just, it's obvious, right? We learned a lot of threading macros. Now just you'd have to expand this into whole stages. And so um, so this is my this is my library. Uh, it's a bunch of utilities. Uh, what I want to show you is just this as an example, right? So usually a data science workflow, machine learning workflow would have some stages like this. You need to fetch data somewhere, you need to clean it, transform it. You have to tune some model and train a model. And then you want to produce some plots, some metrics to show stakeholders or, or to yourself. And you want to have an actual model in the end. Um, you can obviously do all of this in a single notebook if you're using only Python, for example. But even if you're using a single language, like right now uh, at Billy in my company, we are only using R for the fraud team. Uh, we don't, you don't use Clojure anymore because we don't need this uh, PDFs that we had before to scrape. But even here, it makes sense to have each of these steps separate because think of them as pure functions, right? Like this stage only does fetching data. So if there's a bug, we only go there and we only fix fetching data. All of the steps after this are untouched, right? And this is the really smart part about DVC is that it creates this graph of dependencies and it only runs the stages that are invalidated every time you make a change. So if you only change, let's say the produce plot stage, which is usually the last thing you do, you're not gonna run the whole pipeline again. It just runs the produce plot stage. Yeah? Um, how would this look in practice? Um, is a bit like this. So DVC in itself is quite simple. It only produces, uh, or you only have to interact mostly with two um, files. There's obviously like a CLI interface and so on, but I will not get into that. Uh, the, the DVC YAML file is where you define stages. So you would say, you know, I'm having here a stage called hello world. I just says run this script with R. There's a dependency on the actual script so that if I change something in the script, the whole, the, the whole uh, pipeline after this stage gets invalidated and um, uh, DVC will run that for you. And I'm also saying there's an output, right? So there's a there's a file here called random numbers that's being saved into data and intermediates. So any stage that's dependent on this file will also subsequently be invalidated and so on. So a very simple example here, we have this hello world stage, it's very dumb. We're just creating some random numbers. Um, and then saving the random numbers, right? All of this other stuff is just thanks from my app to uh, make it nice. So if you run, we have a single stage uh, to run the whole thing, we just say DVC repro. And now DVC checks this file, uh, but nothing changed because I ran this before. Well, it would run the whole stage, right? It will run this single stage and then you get this output. But now, 
there's also a really cool other feature. That's why we wanted to use this in the first place, which is the version control part. This DVC log file is keeping a hash of all of the files that you have in the pipeline that you tell DVC that exists. So you told DVC you are dependent on this uh, script. And so it hashes the script. Uh, there's also an output called random numbers, which we can see here. It's an actual, actual just a file. Um, and also has a hash. Now, instead of saving all of these files into Git, which can become very cumbersome, like some, some deep, deep neural network, um, uh, deep learning uh, models can be gigabytes in size, right? So you don't want to put this into GitHub. So what, what DVC does is just saving this file. And then you can push your actual file somewhere else. So for example, you can have in GitHub, the DVC log file saying, this is the hash of the file that I need. And then the actual file lives in an S3 bucket somewhere or in a Google Drive or in Dropbox. This is actually what we do uh, at Billy to deploy models to production. The only thing we have to do is merge to master. And then um, we have another script that runs DVC and says, hey, fetch all the models that are available. And it grabs them from S3 and then deploys those files into the prod service. So we never have to deal with very large files being saved in, um, in Git. Another cool aspect of this is that you can always go back in time and check what happened with that specific pipeline, right? So you have a reproducibility in that sense. If I save things as they are today, I push them to GitHub and then Daniel or Kira or someone else pulls my, my, my repo, if they have access to the remote storage, say this S3 bucket, um, they can just do DVC push, uh, pull. So you have the same, so just say this, it will not work because I have nothing um, configured. But if you would run this command, you would pull all of the files that are in the remote storage with the correct hashes. And now you can run the pipeline yourself and you will get exactly the same results as I am getting. So this is also super important in uh, data science, you know, being reproducible and transparent and auditable to understand what is going on and uh, uh, what files change and when. Now, just you know, as an example, let's say we want to add a new stage. Um, so what you would do is you would simply add, you know, let's say this is the hello world to stage. I cheated, right? So I already have a, a script there. And I say, I want to, this stage want, needs to run the hello world again um, pipeline or our script, sorry. And I'm saying it's dependent on uh, this script, which is stored in stages. So you have these two scripts here. You can look at it, it's very simple. And um, I want it to be dependent also on the output of the first stage, right? So I just do something like this. So now, um, and there's no outputs in this stage. So now I'm telling DVC, look, there's a change in the pipeline. I save the file. Um, DVC will compute all the dependencies. And now if I run this, it will detect, okay, there's a new stage that didn't run. Okay, let me show you this. So we did DVC repro here. And so you see DVC detected, uh, no, not this one. Uh, yeah, running stage. So the first stage didn't change, hello world. We didn't do any change to the, to the script or the outputs. So it's not running anything, which is very efficient, but it found there's a new stage now called hello world two. It's running it. Um, and you can see here, we are just saying that uh, we are pulling in the results from the previous stage. We are saving it into a variable and then we are just passing it into a big string and printing the string here. So these are very you know, basic examples, but now you can expand this into thinking, you can have a stage for fetching data from a DB, then you train the model, you do all sorts of things. Um, in production in my company, we have around 14 stages because you need to do a lot of fetching from different sources. Um, uh, we also have multiple models running in the same pipeline. And so instead of having you know, one fraud model, for example, going from top to bottom, we actually have sort of a for loop training multiple ones always in the same in the same pipeline. And 
as you see, this is not specific to data science. This is not specific to machine learning. It's a very abstract way of saving um, intermediate data and running uh, stages in a graph that you need. So if you want to interrupt for whatever reason, uh, like I had to interrupt with closure just to parse, uh, like to do OCR on some PDF files. It has nothing to do with machine learning, but closure was the best tool for the job. So I created a stage using a Babashka script to do this and DVC doesn't care. As long as you can run here a command using bash or whatever shell you have, DVC will do it. And that's kind of my super fast intro to DVC. <laughs> Very good. Thank you. Are there questions? If not, I go back to my slides a bit. A very good introduction was exactly the level which was needed to, to understand what I will present now. Okay, if there's no questions, I go ahead. Okay, as I said before, these uh, in-process interop, uh, they are, yeah, they work 99%, but not 100%, so it's good to have a plan B. Uh, so that was my basic uh, in, uh, way why I wanted to uh, use something like DVC. Uh, I was as well only looking at the pipeline part, but then I learned as well the data versioning part. So now I'm convinced completely about DVC, uh, but I came to it because I wanted to have uh, a way to run fewer Python just in case I'm in this 1% incompatibility and blip Python and Clojure I don't do the job. Uh, so yes, as I was saying, complex Python libraries which doing optimized number crunching are maybe in the most unstable, the most difficult for the Python, CJ and Clojure are. Because yes, we have native C code, we have GPU, we have multi-core, we have distributed and do have these absolutely reliable working uh, in the lib Python CJ and closures, I think is a, is a big challenge. But ma machine learning model training is, is there. So the training part of uh, machine learning is often native code, GPU, multi-core distributed because we want to have these things fast. So there we should use DVC. Uh, so um, overall, as uh, it was presented in DVC, the whole training of a model can be split in these several steps. Each step is a, scale, a shell script as we see, so execution of a CSG file or of a Python file or an R file, there's no difference for DVC. So that means that Clojure is fully supported by DVC, as is any other programming language, because it is programming language neutral. So that is a very big uh, uh, advantage. Uh, so for example, the interop, which I'm going to talk about then today mainly, is a different type of interop. It's not the Python CSG on Clojure's R. It is to have different different programming languages uh, in the same uh, uh, pipeline. So closure mainly, hopefully, and where needed, the other, lang the other languages. So it would be the opposite of what Santiago was presenting. No, I, my aim would be to have a pipeline where I do everything in closure, except the few things which I cannot do in closure. For example, the data pre-processing, uh, I would do now in closure because uh, uh, a table clause or that uh, tech data set, they are full featured compared to pandas in my use. There's basically no reason not to use uh, those. And then we can, for example, write the pre-processed data as arrow files. We don't do CSV. CSV is bad, but we can do arrow files. And then the next step is a Python script, which reads the arrow file, and then it does the thing. So train a model, for example. In this situation, the required Python code at the end will be very short. So this is it, it, it is as well something for closure developers, which don't want to learn Python. Python or we don't do Python or prefer closure, but it can be a few lines probably copied from somewhere because if you go for any example, how to do a, a certain model training in Python, these few lines you need to put there in this file, they will be there always. So there's a lot of examples to, to, to reuse. So, so you can basically avoid to learn Python if you don't want to. Uh, and this is 100%. Yes. Sorry, can I just, um, yeah. because you, you said it so so quickly, it doesn't sound like a big deal, but <laughs> the what you say here, write the pre-processed data as error files. This is essentially the only limitation we have when you're doing interop with this DVC model, with DVC framework, right? Because as long as the, as the different language you're using can speak the same file format, yes, I agree, then you're yeah. good to go. Like this is the only limitation you have. You just yeah. need to have, like you said, little type Python script saying train model, import data, output, export data, and you're back in your happy closure land. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it is true. You are right. And that is rather new because let's say if I would have looked at that two years ago, there was a certain moment where I did not find a data format except CSV, which is supported by the three languages, Clojure, Python, R. There was none. There was no table format on disk supported between these three languages. Very recently, uh, uh, Arrow took it ahead. So you did either CSV, which all the risks that the different CSV implementations do things slightly different. So you, especially on text files, uh, they operate. But at least since a year or something, this is uh, about to be solved. And even Arrow is very efficient. So I think, uh, but you are perfectly right. I said it in a line, but one year ago or two years ago, this would have been a, a more of a headache. Yes, yes, I agree. Yes, that this uh, became important. And maybe there's even a goal in future for that because arrow supports as well a kind of in-memory sharing of the data so i think very soon it will be even possible to have our our steps in uh, in different shell scripts but they point to the same memory location so we don't even need to copy the data I, i'm not sure if that is already working like that but that is the, one of the ideas of arrow so basically the, far, the, the the data will be somewhere in the ram of the computer and all three tools point to the same file kind of in memory so you don't even need to write them to disk anymore this is i'm not really sure that we are there yet but this is the, one of the reasons of the existence of of, of arrow voila so uh, if we do these things then we are 100 percent compatible with standard python because we run a standard python interpreter so we are it's guaranteed that all these python libraries are working in the same way uh, in our uh, poly uh, pulley uh, language pipeline than if we would use um, Python alone. Then before we dive a little bit more into the, the code, uh, I, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the ski cloche metamorph concept of pipelines. We use in both the word pipelines. Uh, I, I don't want to give an introduction, but just for the people who haven't heard it, so this uh, ski cloche machine learning library, which, which I'm developing, has is a certain kind of a pipeline as well, which maybe the simplest way to think about that, it's an extension of the closure threading macro. So you pass a kind of context around and that context contains the full state of your data processing. And the full state is not only the data file, but as well some auxiliary data. So instead of saving these auxiliary data in, in, in vast enclosure, you can save them inside of this context, which you passed from one to the other. Uh, that is this concept of, of a ski cloche ML pipeline. Very briefly, I just want to compare these two because yeah, uh, they are two different things with the same name, pipeline, but they are technically very, very unrelated. So, so they have basically nothing to do with each other. They're just both called pipelines. So we need to be careful a bit there. So the DVC pipelines, as explained before, uh, they have steps and each step is a cell script. So I call them out of process pipeline no? because there's no single process which executes the pipeline. Each each one is a new shell script and they communicate between each, each other by writing data to uh, to disk. We need to set explicitly the dependencies as we have seen it, and then uh, DVC de decides what to do, what to run in which order. So it is the concept of the of this uh, dependency graph uh, uh, Santiago was, was talking about. So we tell the thing which are the inputs and the outputs of each step we can write the steps in any order into this yaml file and it will the, detect the order and it will detect automatically what needs to be rerun that is the dvc pipeline the ski cloche uh, ml library has optionally a concept of metamorph based pipeline so it's a, again it's a kind of threading macro it runs in process it runs always the full pipeline in sequential order yeah so these two have nothing to do with, with one one of the other what they have to do is that both support hyperparameter search of an ml pipeline with pre-processing modeling prediction and model evaluation steps so you can either do that that i would say is the takeaway from that in, in machine learning there always comes this problem of hyperparameter search which means 
that you want to be sure to rerun the same steps uh, over and over and over with slightly different parameters and you want to keep somehow track which has the best matrix out of that and they are in both pipeline versions they support that uh, but in very different forms one is in process sequential the other one is out of process uh, non-sequential explicit dependencies so but they both are meant to solve the same issue these hyperparameter search of uh, of an ml pipeline so dfos dvc supports this explicitly it's an explicit feature of the tool because it's a machine learning platform or machine learning experimentation platform out of process and it's basically supported by run these dvc pipelines so run the shell script several times so from outside, I tell it the parameters in a certain parameter file, and then I just rerun these, uh, these uh, uh, shell scripts again and again and again. And uh, DVC then by itself, it stores the hyperparameters and performance matrices persistently. That is a big thing here. So what each time I run uh, a pipeline, the, the, the outputs of the, and the inputs, but as well the, the, the hyperparameters I have used and the, the, the model performance I get out of that, they are stored automatically by DVC. I don't need to do anything for that. So in this, in this context, the DVC goes under this, um, this word of it's a machine learning experimenting platform because that that is what DVC is it, it, it is a yeah it is yeah a machine learning experimenting platform there are several for that and DVC is simply one of them and ski JL pipelines on the other side they support as well in process hyperparameter search but this is not persistent if if my closure to if my closure process ends everything what 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 I've done before is gone. So the maximum kind of I can do, it, it's just that I run it and then it prints me on the screen, which were the best hyperparameters. And then I can keep that for, for something and apply it somehow. But there's no concept of persistence in that because Skiglo JML plus Metaphor, Metamorph pipelines, it is not a machine learning experimenting platform. And it will likely never be because that would mean to re-implement DVC in close. And that's for sure not uh, uh, what we want to do. Uh, and I think it's not, it, there's no added value uh, in that neither. So a difference between machine learning experiment and platform versus an in-process way of hyperparameter optimization. The best that I came now to by, by using this a little bit is the best practice I think is not to combine the two forms of pipeline, I think. So, so we need to decide if we start let's say a new uh, machine learning uh, thing either i do metaphor metamorph pipelines and i i know that i do in process hyperparameter search i know i know that i do closure only eventually using lib python crg because that i would somehow consider still in process with uh, uh in process or i say no i use dvc i use the dvc based Type parameter search and I do a, because I probably need to do a polyglot pipeline. I think it's a decision which needs to be taken in the beginning, either or the other. Ski Cloger ML still makes sense in both, as this metamorph pipeline concept in Ski Cloger ML is optional. So we don't need to use it. So we can still use Ski Cloger ML as a unified API to lots of machine learning models because the metamorph pipeline concept is optional from my point of view as more serious the ml project is as more we need dvc serious i mean uh, yeah more than uh, more than doing it kind of once and more, more than learning maybe that is what i want to say while i still learn machine learning as a as a, as a concept then maybe i don't need DV, i don't need dvc but if i want to produce a good model than any dvc and because this persistence of experiment results uh, but as well the other features of dvc uh, like the data versioning and the versioning of of the code it does as well it does keeps track of code changes that uh, Santiago didn't mention so dvc keeps track of code changes data changes hyperparameter changes and metric changes sees these four things together it keeps track of and the relationship between the between these four 
migration from one to the other approach doesn't work neither in the sense of because if you start with the metamorph pipeline approach and then you should go to dvc you need to rewrite your pipeline because the 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 way the hyper parameters are uh, given to the to the in the different forms is completely different so to a large extent you need to change the uh, the what you did before so it is a it is a decision which needs to be taken on the beginning i think me personally i will now or always start with DC from the first day. In the sense of even if I have only in the beginning, in the beginning there's darkness. So even if I have two lines of closure, I will use DVC from the first day. Now. Um, will that mean that I stop using metamorph pipe, metamorph pipelines? I th maybe yes. I think the answer is yes. Because uh, the, the big selling point why we have developed metamorph pipelines was to, for doing in process says hyperparameter search. Yes, but by, with DVC, we don't do in-process hyperparameter search. We do out-of-process hyperparameter search. So the only reason somehow to keep eventually the metamorph pipelines would be that it's, far, that it's much faster. Because as I said before, uh, if we use the DVC approach to hyperparameter search, each, um, each uh, hyperparameter combination requires a full run of the of the of all the scripts in my pipeline, or at least the training script. So there's a no pure, there's always a no new process to be started, which in closure means we already need to wait to start for closure. On the other side, that doesn't matter. In the in the approach of DVC, these things they somehow run in the background. There's a concept of queuing. There will be soon a kind of distributed running of these things. Yes, there is a performance penalty, but I think in practice you get you press a button to execute your queue, then you go to bed and you have your results. That is the way people can use, uh, I, I would use DVC. Um, so I will probably stop to a certain way uh, using the metamorph pipelines because I will do now DVC from always from first, first day onwards. Um, there's maybe a mixture of the two because there is something in DVC of a feature which eventually allows to mix the two. That is a good idea, I'm not sure. Uh, so DVC has a feature to register persistently in process created snapshots. So we, what we can do in DVC as well, we can write a loop in Clojure or in Java over our hyperparameters. And then in, after we have done one model training in the loop, we somehow, we write some marker files to disk and then DVC will somehow detect that it now should register this step into its registry of, of, of uh, uh, into its persistent database of, of uh, matrices. So um, it is a little bit similar to what uh, deep learning libraries do in any case, because if you use uh, a deep learning library like TensorFlow, they always have this concept that in a training run, it creates several, ver several versions of the, of the model. It writes it to disk, it evaluates the hyperparameter, Meters, so it writes while the single Python script is running, it writes this stuff to disk. And so there we can somehow hook in this. We basically, DVC can listen to this writing to disk of the of the single Python or closure process. So we could eventually combine these two. This thing requires a Python API to be used. This is first class. They have foreseen to do that in all languages by writing, let's say, these marker files on disk. Uh, so this is documented. So there's a certain way you need to write certain files on disk, and this would work as well. So maybe there's a way to combine the advantages of the two. So the in-process pipelines and still use uh, uh, DVC. Are there any questions so far? Uh, I'm curious how... Hello, I don't hear you, Santiago. Hello? Can you hear me? No. Yes, no, yes. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes. Um, uh, if you're going to talk, if you have more slides to show, then I'll leave the discussion to what, the end. One, what, yeah, one or two for the demo, and then we would go to the code. All right. It's just because in in what we do in my company is actually mix both. So we are not using Metamorph, we're using R, but uh, we run the hyperparameter search within um, an R script. 
while okay. everything else is in, in DVC, right? So we still do everything in process, all the parts yeah. that take a lot of time and everything else is just externalized. So we have one stage, which is just hyperparameter search. Then we store a file with um, the results of that and any metrics okay. attached to it. Now, okay. we use XGBoost, which is a lot faster to train. So if you're training a very complicated deep learning uh, model, um, you would need to use these marker files because most of the time you want to do, you want to stop at some point, right? Um, yes, yes, yes. And so you need state within the within the training process. If you use something like XGBoost, which runs reasonably fast training a model, uh, then I would say it's actually an, an okay approach. You just write so that, your full so pipeline that, in DVC and then have yeah. in process hyperparameter search. So that means as well that you don't use these DVC exp feature, the DVC experimentation, because it's rather new, I think. It is only yeah. existing in DVC since a year or something. Exactly. I, I never, I never it tried it. Okay. okay. Because that yeah. basically what it does, it remembers all these uh, parameters and the matrices for you. So it replaces your file at the end. You know, instead of writing a file to disk with all results and all, uh, you would have it in the database of DVC, which you can mm -hmm. query and all of that. But it's a rather new feature. Yes. Yes. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? No. Then we look at a little bit at the com at the concrete demo which I was doing, or the complete uh, task I was doing uh, with this DVC. Uh, so the the code we will look at to a certain level is a is a Kaggle uh, to to participate in a Kaggle competition. The Kaggle competition, uh, you know, it's a it's a platform for doing data science uh, competitions. There's always always supervised learning. Uh, so the one I was picking is uh, about predicting if a tweet is about a real or a fake disaster. So you have the text of the tweet, and you need to say, and and the model should say if this if this is a tweet about a real disaster or is the fake disaster. So it it goes in this direction of uh, uh, fake news detection. It is one of the entry and entry uh, cargo competition, which is kind of running time. So there's no price in it. You just participate for for kind of fun. It is a classical supervised text classification problem, binary uh, text classification. So you, if you if you don't know the training data, it is basically the text and uh, uh, the, the the class assigned to it, real or fake, and then you you train a model for that in a supervised way. And the model should then predict real or fake on unseen, uh, unseen text. If you do that in Python, the current state of the art is a, is a class of NLP models, which are called uh, transformer models. Yeah, deep learning models. Uh, I don't want to go into details of, of that. They're the state of the art. Uh, there's now the, the there came with uh, ten, uh, ten, TensorFlow or uh, another other Python based uh, deep learning libraries. There's now a rather new wrapper around that, uh, of, around these transformers, which is simple transformers. It's called the library. It is a wrapper around these models. So basically, in three or four lines of code, you can use them for your text classification uh, uh, problem. So it requires very little code to train, evaluate, and, and uh, use the model for, for inference. There are eventually uh, Java solutions upcoming to, yeah, because this transformer uh, is, let's say it's a fab of algorithms. So nobody, it, they could be re-implemented in Java. I think so far, nobody nobody did that. The, yeah, they exist in, in, in Python. And if you use them for other languages, you basically use wrapping approaches. So I think R can use them as well via uh, the, the R Python integration, or we use we can use them uh, potentially in on the GVM, uh, in, so in Clojure with lib Python uh, CLG. But I was that with these models, so with just these Python libraries, simple transformers, I was in the 1% uh, uh, area of libraries which are not working well with the Python CLG. Yeah, we had a lot of debugging sessions uh, with Chris Nuremberger on that. We, we came to somehow a stable situation, but it is a complicated, it is a difficult library for uh, uh, to, be, to get it fully supported with um, lib 
Python's ERG. And the, what you get as failures is very, is very unsatisfactory because you get GVM crashes. So there's absolutely no way unless you are a GVM expert to even start to debug that. So it is a very nasty beast. And the ways we improve that, the stability of that, uh, that's what it went down to doing things with the, with the JIL, so the global interpreter lock of Python, disable uh, uh, multiprocessor, do certain things in a different way. And finally, it boils down that lib Python CRG is not the same as a uh, as a pure Python interpreter, it, 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 because it does a form of running Python, which is called embedded Python. So other people use as well em embedded Python, but it is not what most people are using. So that it's, it's just uh, uh, not a lot tested. So I have a, a we will see a DVC pipeline with three steps. We will process the data that is in closure. We train the model that will be in Python. Then we run the prediction, uh, uh, and there I will use uh, closure using libpython CRG. So in training and run prediction, it will both be the simple transformers library, but the third, uh, so the prediction step, is not critical at all. It runs very, it, it runs without any problem uh, via libpython CRG. It was the training which was not working well. Uh, so these three steps, they communicate via uh, writing, reading data files on disk, as foreseen by DVC. Uh, voila, that we will look at now. Unless somebody wants to comment something. We're now back to the screen. Uh, seeing some comments here, clarifying with arrow, hijack this feature to train the same model. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Uh, this is the arrow one. Somebody, Ian Wood was asking, yeah, arrow Apache, yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay, if there are no other comments, then we look a little bit, how much time is it? We still have officially, yes, we are fine in time, 27 minutes. So we look a little bit at the code. You see my Emacs now? Yes. Are you yes. seeing Emacs? Oh, yeah. Yes, okay. So we will start by looking at the pipeline. Uh, the concrete pipeline we going to use to participate in this Kaggle competition. So we have the stages, as uh, uh, said before. I have three stages. One stage is pre-process, so this is closure. It's a closure script doing something. I set the dependencies of that because I need to tell it the dependencies and the outs, so it can construct these dependency graph. So I tell it, yeah, my dependencies is the closure file itself, of course the training data and test data as CSV because I downloaded them from Kaggle and they, uh, they, they come as CSV. And the outputs of that will be that I write a train.error and the test.error. So the code, and we will see that, it will open these CSV files, do a little bit of pre-processing and write them back as error files. Why arrow? Yeah, it was this thing that, I was ho that I'm hoping, I'm still convinced that to working with arrow between uh, 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 between closure and Python is less problematic than CSV because CSV at the end is untyped. So you are always in the in the mercy of uh, of the of the uh, concrete CSV implementation. If writing from closure CSV and reading that from Python will not lose something, or will do things slightly different. And I think and I yeah I no, arrow is meant to solve this problem. Of course, it depends how how far developed the different libraries are. It's still a rather new format, but I think it is now reliable enough, uh, at least to for for standard data types as uh, floats and strings and booleans and dates. Uh, yeah, of course, dates is a difficult one eventually, uh, but it is meant to solve this problem. So I, I I'm putting there a lot of hope uh, uh, that over over the next uh, time these libraries, they will improve as well and that we get a very, very good uh, in, uh, interoperability between the, between the, the, the three, between all programming languages, let's say. Then we have a train step. Let's we run a Python process here. So this is pure Python. Uh, yeah, the dependencies is of course the Python script itself and the outputs from here are now my inputs, train.arrow, test.arrow. This one, uh, as we do, uh, uh, as this is a, a TensorFlow model, it writes a lot of stuff. 
it, uh, because it does uh, on every training step, it writes these whole bunch of, of, of things. It does uh, the different epochs. So at every epoch, there's a file written. So it writes a rather large and complex uh, directory. But I can just say, this is the output directory. And that is my, my, my dependency. As I said before, there's specific support in DVC for matrices. Um, so uh, by writing these matrices to a JSON file, DC knows that these matrices are existing. There are some naming conventions of, uh, there are some conventions of that. Maybe we can just open that script. Eval, oops. Um, I don't see, I don't see my, uh, it's annoying. I don't see, I, uh, but JSON. Basically, uh, uh, if, if I do something like that, then DVC knows that I have a matrix called MCC and there's a little bit of hierarchy supporting. So DVC understands these type of things. And this, then, the, then the user interface of DVC, so the, the command line things, they can show me the matrices. Um, and I need to tell it as well, what are the parameters to my script? Because if I'm telling it that, it tracks as well the parameters. So because as I said before, DVC tracks a lot of things. And the thing it tracks, they can be brought down to the data files. So it traces different versions of these. That was Santiago has explained. It traces the code as well. But it co collaborates as well with JIT. So the code is traced on two levels, either as JIT commits and on this level. And there's a, maybe a little bit of things, what that what, but it works together with JIT. And it traces, uh, and it traces the parameters. And the way parameters are handled uh, in DVC is that there, there's, a there's a convention about a certain file which need to exist on disk. And the default name is paramscom.yaml. So if I have a YAML file like this, this is JSON. It is badly formatted because I wrote that uh, by library, but it's uh, it's a JSON file. It's it's a it's a it's a, it's a YAML file. I mean, wondering is this even valid YAML? I'm just it's not even JSON here. Ah, anyway, uh, it can be it can be YAML or JSON. It supports both because this looks to me like JSON, but I call it YAML and it doesn't matter. Anyway, uh, and if I do it in that way, then DVC will as well know what were my parameters to every run. So I can basically ask it which were the parameters of this run and which matrix has changed and what is the dependency eventually between the parameters and the change and that it can produce me plots out of that. So what uh, these kind of things we want to do if we if we uh, uh, want to know which parameter has which influence on my on my model. So this I need to tell it here as well, which are the parameters this script is understanding. And at the end, what the code is doing, the code then need to read this file. So you, you will see that in the train.python that there's some code which is just opening this file. And then it sends these parameters to the training run as, 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 as configuration for the, for the training. We will see that. And then we have a last step here, which is the predict toggle. This is as well uh, from the level of the of the of the pipeline here. It's a, it's a closure call. Uh, my dependencies are the is the output, right? And it is the code itself, and it produces a file which I can, which I can send direct to to Kaggle. So it does the inference of the it does the, it runs the prediction. So it uses the model which was trained before uh, to run predictions. Uh, on, uh, I didn't declare a dependency to the cargo thing. That is a good point here. It's not important, I think, because the, that is one of the things that the code doesn't do automatically. So if I open, for example, source predict cargo, I think it's reading, it's writing. It reads this, and I didn't declare that. So that is one of the things, of course, you need to keep aware of. It will not detect that my code is reading this file. So I somehow forgot to declare it here. It means if that file would change, it would not rerun the code, what it should do. So I forgot uh, it's test.csv, was it correct? That is one of the things we need to care, we need to be uh, careful with as it is explicitly, I need to declare the dependencies. If I do their mistake, then it might not rerun the things the, the moment it should. Uh, 
I mean, to, to be pedantic uh, voilà. person, I guess you should depend uh, on the arrow file, no? Uh, is it I know for, for the for the point of the yeah. demo, it doesn't matter, right? But because you're using no, 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 I file, don't need no, no, I need to because I only need the model at this point in time. Yeah. I read the model. I only need the model. I don't need the arrow files anymore here, because this contains the model. Because the model was written to disk, so my data is here. I don't need them here. I need it here. I need it. Uh, I need it here. That's correct. Here I need them. Here. That wasn't the train. The training takes the arrow files and produces the model, and this one uses the model and the test data to to make the prediction for for cargo submission. So this is uh, fine here. So let's briefly look at the code. It is very short. We look at these three different pieces. So we have this pre-process file, which is com which is com which is um, only closure. Yes, we require we only need uh, tablecloth. Uh, we require this arrow library, uh, and we do uh, here, here. This is the main method, which is called from my thing here. So here I call this function here, and this function is this one. So what I do, uh, I read the training data, and uh, yeah, I, I have here not a very good naming thing. I basically from Kaggle I get a train CSV file, but the training I need uh, the train I need to split in train and test. We always need to be confusing with the names here, no? Because uh, uh, Kaggle gives me two files. It gives me one file which contains the truth, that is the train file, and it gives me another file on which I need to predict. So if they come from Kaggle, they are called train and test.csv. And then yeah, I, sp I split the train and call it then train and test, which is not a good naming convention. I should call it validation or something anyway. The, the code here reads the train uh, CSV file. It does a little bit of processing. The processing here is very little. Uh, maybe we could even should we open this file? Maybe do I have an? Maybe you can just play a bit with that. So if I open this file, uh, what will happen? Yes. Uh, yeah. Now of course I'm getting. I always do it like that. I always use this thing here. So we see it's a data set. It contains uh, the text column. So we have an NLP problem. It contains two other two other columns because the text they have a location and a keyword and we can of course imagine that the location uh, of a disaster is maybe important to predict if it's a fake or a real disaster it's clear if the location would be moon it cannot be a real disaster right because there's no disaster on the moon um, and there's as well keyword so in this concrete problem uh, the input data is not only the text but is as well two, uh, two different columns, the two text columns. Maybe we, have, we open them a bit. So let's say we look at these keywords. Keyword, there's a lot of missing data you see here, lots of it. Uh, so can I see them here? Ah, yeah. So there's some keywords here. Some people gave basically keywords to their, uh, to their tweets because it's come somehow from Twitter. I don't even know how they relate because if it's Twitter, there's only the tweet. Anyway, this is the one column, and the other column is uh, the location. There's a lot of missings as well. I oh, know there's no missing. No, sorry, I'm opening the wrong one. It was the text. There's no missingness. Here we have as well a lot of missing data. And if it's not missing, then we see things like uh, yeah, the location, things like that, completely random stuff. As everybody types as he wants. So it looks to me like a lot of garbage that you cannot really do a lot with that. And the only thing the code is doing, it adds them to the text because I do a simple transformer model and the simple transformer model can only take text as an input, one text thing. I cannot give it tables or something. A simple transformer model needs text. So what I do, I basically add these two columns, I add them into the text. So my final text, which the model is using for, for training is the tweet, the tweet text plus this keyword and the location, I just append it, I append it to the text. And then I hope that uh, the transformer model will use it for, for something. Because that is the way uh, uh, these NLP models of these transformer class work. They can only work with text. They cannot work with uh, other features. 
voila. And then I write these things to, I, I do a split. I split this train and uh, uh, this is by default 20, 80 uh, or 80, 20 split. So 80% of that becomes training data. The remaining 20 be becomes test. I write them to disk. As I said, I should use here a different name. It should be better validation, not to get confused with the test.csv. Uh, voilà. uh, then we have a look at the Python script. Python script. This is very, very short, triton.py. This is now using the simple transformer library. So in my, if I run this code, I need to be in a virtual environment, the classical Python stuff, where this library, uh, the simple transformers library is uh, installed. I need to use pandas and py arrow feather. This gives the support of reading arrow files. So then I read here my YAML things here. Uh, yeah, I don't know what I did wrong here. Maybe I, does it even working? Because my, I think now the, the files are in JSON format. Somehow I, I swapped there something. Anyway, the code here, it would use these, uh, it would read this file that we saw before, this uh, params file. And basically it would take all the, all the parameters from here and pass them to the call to train the model. So it, I read here these uh, I, I read here these arguments. They go into the variable params, and then I make one overall uh, uh, map. No, a dictionary. We are in Python, so we talk about dictionaries. I have some other parameters which I don't want to uh, uh, hyper uh, hyper. Uh, they are not they are parameters to the model training, but I don't want to optimize them. They are more technical parameters, like uh, should I use CUDA. It's not that I want to try if CUDA is working or not, uh, better working. So these are kind of fixed. And then I merge them with the parameters I, I get from here. Then I read the training data, very simple. I read these two files. And then I use the, the simple, uh, uh, simple transformers code to make a classification model. Uh, one part of the parameters is which model am I using? So I use a model called Bert, no, a, a model type Bert and a model name Bert Tiny. This points to registered models in a uh, kind in a in a model registry, which comes together with uh, which is working uh, supported by TensorFlow, hugging, hugging face, hugging face hub or something. There are thousands of models there, and each model has basically a name, a unique identification. So uh, in that way, I can basically try a lot of models by just uh, give it, put in their name there. Then the library does everything automatic. It downloads the model, which might be gigabytes, so it can take long and all of that, but it does that all automatic. And that is one of the hyperparameters. Which concrete model do I want to use? Do I want to use Bert or Roberta or any of those? Voila, and then I run my training. So one line of code, train the model. I have my uh, data frame. The two arrow files is one for training data, and I evaluate the model while I run the training. So I have evaluation data here. So again, there's this confusion about the do we call these things evaluation test or validation data? There's a lot of there's no there's not a clear convention how these things should be called. And I get an ev evaluation result, which is basically my matrix. I've chosen here a, a very specific a certain matrix to measure how good my model is. And that gets uh, and then, that I write to this file we looked at. So the end of the training run is that, uh, and I and it produces a lot of files in my output directory. So if I show you my output directory, where are we? Uh, I don't see what is this thing. Not to see this button. Uh, it goes me in the way. Hide. Or can I do this? Okay, to split the screen is not, I cannot see what I'm typing. So LS output. So in here, in here is the result of a training run uh, uh, of this model. So this, all this is produced while the model is training. Uh, so he, this is the model file, the, the, this is the train model as such, a binary file, rather big. Uh, but it does as well some checkpointing. So while it's running, it writes, uh, different versions of the model into different directories, just in case it's crashing. Although you don't lose all of the all of the work, because if this is running for days, if it's crashing in the last round, then at least we have the models of before. It always saves as well the evaluation results, so I would not need to do that. 
in any case, if I have this is this is the full specification of the model which was created. So if I want to use some Python code which runs predictions, I need to give it this this directory with all these files, and that is then um, what happens in the last step. So if I go back to the code, this was the Python part, and now in the in the prediction part, I use as well the same library, but this time I use it from closure via the Python CRG. And I can have, I cannot see what, what does it below my cursor. How can I get this away? Hide? No. Sharing your screen? Can I? Ah, I can move this finally. So uh, now we go to the last file, which does the prediction. So this is the one which is the third step of the, the first step of the of the um, VVC pipeline. So here we use libpythoncrg and we use the same Python library, simple transformers. We do a kind of uh, requiring here in this form. I don't know if you have used the Python CRG before. So if you did, if you do this type of stuff, your Python API it looks like closure. You no, know, we write something like that, but in reality, this is now a Python a Python class. But I can use it in this in in closure in closure syntax. So what this code is doing, it reads as well these parameters. I'm just wondering why I even need to read them. I think I don't need them here even. Do I? Probably I don't need them. Ah, yes, I need to get the model type on top of it. Okay, what happened before is that I, I have now on disk, I have my trained model, but I need to, to run prediction. I need to read it from disk. So I need to create an instance of this classification model, and this apparently needs this model type. So I need to tell it the type of the model, which would be bad, and then I point to the place on disk where this best model was stored by the training one. Then I load my training data. I need to rerun the same pre-processing. No? And that is one of the things which Kiklo JML, the metamorph pipeline helped a little bit for. That the, 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 uh, I need to make sure here that I run exactly the same pre-processing on this data than I, I was using on the, on, the, on the training data. Anyway, now I have my, my test data and I just run on this Python model. I run predict with the test data and I get my prediction. Yeah, here we are already starting the nifty part. So apparently there's uh, some options in libpython CRG to get this thing more stable, to do to wrap that in some Jill context or not. I don't know if this would be needed here. Maybe not. Anyway, uh, I have now my prediction and I write the prediction to my file. So at the end, I get an output file, which I send to Kaggle. So I send this file to Kaggle, and then it will give me a score on the leaderboard because it will basically Kaggle knows the truth for all of these. I make a prediction. The prediction is that it's the type or it's the ID of the text somehow, and it will tell me where I'm on the leaderboard. So in this way, I can participate fully in Kaggle uh, competitions from from uh, from Closure. Uh, is there anything else in the this file? Because if not, uh, ah, yeah, there's some plotting in here. That is one of the features which is supported as well by by DVC. So it can plot uh, uh, certain things which we always use in machine learning. And can be, uh, this is the this is the training curve. Do, do I have that on disk? Uh, I think I have the file. I can have a look at that. Because one of the questions we always get uh, at the end in machine learning, did my uh, do I have it in there? Do we see? So one of the fee of the features of um, DVC is as well that supports this plotting. Yes, it produces an HTML file, but it will work to open that in browser index HTML. But this produces a learning curve. So this is the, this is way this is the way how we data scientists now say does this model generalize. So, because what we see here that uh, uh, the training loss goes down all the time, but this is normal. If the model architecture is complex enough, my training loss will always go down to zero. But at a certain moment, we will start to overfit, and this moment, this moment is somewhere here. So, the moment the evaluation loss goes down, uh, goes up again, which is somewhere here. Here it starts to go up again. Here we start to overfit the model. So that means that the very best model is not the one with the lowest training loss, 
but it's probably this one. So no, there are some ways to automatically stop the training at these points in time, but this, so after 400 steps, this model here would now be the best one. Uh, I'm not sure if I saved that. I hopefully I have saved it. Normally the TensorFlow library does that. So it saves uh, every X step, it saves my model. And then I could say, ah, yes, exactly. That is the one which goes into this best model uh, directory because the model I'm using, if we look at the code again, uh, for the prediction, uh, while, while um, the model training is, uh, while the model training is running, um, the simple transformer snapshots, uh, that means that every X steps, it runs the evaluation. We see it has run it at this point in time, 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 it runs the evaluation. And each time it does so, it saves the model to disk. And the best model of all of that will at the end end in this folder best model, right? But there, there are other versions of the model, but this one is the best. So this is some way of, of, of interpreting the, the, the training run. Uh, voila. I think we are more or less done. There, that's what I wanted to present. If we, if there, are either we go now to questions. If not, I have, I would have uh, just five minutes more to show something. But uh, in general, that's my presentation. Uh, back to back to you for questions and discussions. Yeah, thanks so much, Carson. That's really cool. Anyone have questions? I have a quick question for Karsten. Um, yes. I, I know that DVC has um, a couple of Python APIs. Um, you know, if it's got Python API, DVC.API to access um, parameters and things like that. And it's also got a DVC live API to do plotting and things. I'm just wondering, I noticed you didn't use them. I was wondering, if that, is that for any particular reason? Because I guess you could use them through um, libpython closure. Or maybe maybe even there's a nice closure wrapper around some of those um, DVC APIs. I'm not sure. I'm not really. I mean, the 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 tool by itself it is command line oriented. No, so that means it it doesn't require the usage of these Python libraries. Uh, why they're then even there? It is a command line tool, and it is com uh, programming language independent. What is true. I can only imagine that there are some libraries which basically automate the command line interface. I'm not sure, but I would not know why I would use that. I mean, in fact, I show you the directory. I use DVC in this way, uh, exp run, that's what I do. That runs the experiments uh, now. Or I do things like DVC, exp, show. This will show me the matrices. Yeah, and that's very nice. So I'm wondering what the what the but the other one what you were talked about the DVC Live that is a commercial tool which they, the the company makes money from but it's separated from the open source DVC this is a kind of visualization of what DVC is doing so instead of looking this in the console you have a nice web page for that but this is uh, what you need that you need to that is commercial so that you need to pay. No, you can you can actually use DVC Live free. Although it might not be. Ah, that, that, okay. So, I didn't know that. I didn't know that. Then but even. but sorry, my, my 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 previous point about the DVC API it allows it allows um, code stages to access things like parameters, etc., from within the code. So you don't have to parse the parameters file. You can just say DVC Live. Give yeah, me but parameters. yeah, but the parameter is a JSON file. So to pass that in in, yeah. in closure is trivial. It's trivial um yeah although it's not well okay it's yeah it's yeah, I there's, some, at there's, library, some, yeah. there's some gotchas that aren't recourse to think but I'm, I, I, okay that's fine thanks there's a nice use case for that um ash which is uh deployments in production like imagine if you have you have a server running python deploying your models and you have dvc a library installed there you could Theoretically, simply send a, a command like your request and say, this is the model that I need you to run. And your server would actually just check, is this loaded? No, then just get it from DVC. Because then you can you can use, not saying this is a good idea, but you could technically use DVC in this way in a production server to just continuously update your model by using their API, which is something you cannot do 
using R or closure today. You would need to do this like in some other way. But but that's one way I guess that Ash is saying using the API from from uh, uh, Python or a way, not necessarily by re replacing what you get from the command line, which is already very very extensive. But there are some use cases which you know it's convenient to use the python api i don't think i don't use it either i use everything in r or closure and just I just use the command line interface but yeah. if you use python it it can add some level of convenience there so my, my colleagues use it actually because they use python yeah maybe for automation so instead of you know if you have yeah. a lot of cli commands to type them all the time instead of typing them and and we have one example for that where i did something like that uh, uh yes that might be the use case for the API, but let's say by principle, and I was as well doing some comments there, uh, I think they have really the aim to stay uh, programming language independent, I would hope so. And I would hope so that uh, uh, that is the case. And that, well, yeah, and that is via the command line interface. So the command line interface is the official entry point to, DV, to DVC. Maybe there are some Python libraries which make certain things easier, or if something is very repetitive, uh, but that you can probably do as well with bash automation, you know, with bash automation, you just write a little bash script, which does stuff. Uh, yeah. So yeah, I haven't used any, uh, uh, uh Python PI for, for DVC. Uh. Yeah. I just want, just one, one final thing to add is that I think, I know you're saying that for instance, instance, it's a simple JSON file to parse the parameters. Some of the JSON files are a little bit more complicated and I don't think the parse ah. easily. No, what I have seen now that you're telling me, there is uh, uh, one way to say the parameters is a simple file, and another way is something more, far more complex. If you have parameters which depend on each other, you can express that in, in Python. That is true. Uh, so you can basically, because it's true that the parameters as they have worked to, so far, you cannot say this parameter should be five, but only if these other parameter is between seven and ten. Something like that you cannot express uh, uh, in this JSON. And yes, there's a way to have your parameter file a real Python script. That is true. Yeah, but they have made an extension there which allows to do that on the on the on the CLI level, and it's called Hydra or Hydra. So this Hydra is a kind of specification language, uh, and that would be again then without Python because that you would again do on the pipe on the on the level of the of the level of the CLI or some specific uh, specification files, which are written in these Hydra language or something. So it's again, not Python, uh, but it, uh, there might be both. Uh... Okay, if there's still five minutes, I want to sh show some because regarding the hyperparameter search, what I would in practice However, in practice, do a hyperparameter search of this. That would basically, if I do that purely by the command line, uh, I don't know if this is really a good example here, but let's say I need to show a little bit too. At this time, so you need to see the command line. So I move that over to my other screen. So this one we don't need. Editor as well. See it. So this one can go. Um, so these hyperparameters, it, it it happens very very quick by only having two, three, or five hyperparameters. But by doing, let's say, a full grid search over them, you end very easily in hundreds of thousands of different combinations. And let's say the pure command line way to do that is that you needed to type uh, 100 times here run and between all these runs you need to change the parameter file so i would do something i, I let's say i do the queue now so it puts it in the queue because it, I, I, if i do the dvc xp run it runs it immediately so i needed to wait i can put it in the queue so it's only queued for running but it doesn't execute it yet so if i do something like that it returns immediately, and then I now would change the file, and I would put it again in the queue. So I would do something like that. Now I change here my hyperparameter, save the file, and I put it again in the queue. So now my queue has two entries here, DVC uh, queue. So this is another feature of DVC, so it manages 
right, can manage kind of queue of things and I can run them in one go. And I hope in the future, this works dist will work distributed on distributed machines via SSH and all of that. So it will do all these things uh, soon. To do that hundred times is already boring. <laughs> no, hundred times here the file and then or for the, 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 so how, but of course, so we, how can we automate that? That is maybe one of the things that API can do. Um, and, but I can do that as well in closure by basically automating the, so the, here I can, I just can shell out to this, I can just shell out to this command all the time. So I can write a little bit of a little piece of closure, which changes my parameter file on disk and it shells out, it runs this, changes the parameter file on disk, shells out and runs this. So th like that, I automate a little bit the, the thing of me changing 100 times the file and pressing the, 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 the run button. And how I can do that, there is, um, I did a little piece of code in uh, ski closure AML, a kind of DVC support, which basically does that. And it looks like from closure to use it, it looks then a little bit like that. So this is this new namespace, which is not published yet. So in a certain way, it would be it would be ski closure ML supporting DVC for this feature thing in here. So what we would do, let's ignore this part. We don't need to read the file. So what I can do then in practice, I can define my search space using existing features of, of uh, tech ML. They were already existing in the old tech ML library, which is this grid search approach. What we can do with that, I can, def I can describe a search space, which can be an arbitrary map. This map here has certain things which stay fixed, for example, I don't want to variate them, but they can still be in here. But there are some things where I want that they get variated, that it produces uh, variations of the same uh, set of parameters. And one way to do that is to say, I want that it does a linear search of uh, between minus one and one of these uh, the decay rate. And I want to do a, li a linear search um, of this uh, learning rate between these two numbers. And if we execute this one, we will see that basically it does by default 100 steps. So there's some support that basically it will now return me all combinations or all variations of this set of parameters. And it will, var it will variate this thing 100, uh, in 100 steps. But that means, and this thing as well in 100 steps, that means in total, it would produce already 100 times 100, which is 10,000. It would produce me 10,000 variations of these things, which I needed to run a model for all these uh, uh, 10,000. And there's a little bit of optimization, which uh, Chris Nürnberger put in this library. And basically, it is called uh, uh, a Sobol grid search. The principle is, that it divides first this search space in big uh, steps. So it, even though it has defined here uh, that this should be brought down in 100, it will first give me minus one and one, which is the two extremes. And that will split it in the middle. And that it will, so it, it does basically, it gives me first the splits of that coarse grained before it goes to the fine grained. So that means in practice, I can take the first X of these 100,000 and they cover already a big part of my search space. So basically by doing, if, by doing something like that, so I run these functions Sobol grid search. This one returns me now a list of maps. So I can just do that like that. A list of maps where this basically, this thing is, var is, is variating. So this variable here goes from minus one to one, the uh, other factor decay rate, it will go from minus one to one, and this learning rate goes between these two, but first in the big steps. And then in the, in the so it's a little bit, uh, instead of doing all the 100,000, which would be a full grid search over my, over my space of, of, of parameters, I can take the first 100 and I cover the most important part of my grid space. So there's a certain optimization here. So I can calculate this one. So then I get 10. I have now 10 maps, a, a, a vector of 10 maps in here. And this one I can then send to this function and it will 
basically the one what I showed for by hand. So it will write to this isparam.yaml file, which is the content of that, picking one value here, picking one value there, and then it runs this command. Which will, so at the, at, the, at, the, at the result, I will get a queue of 10 runs with the adapted parameters. So to demonstrate that, I kill now the queue. We will see, we see queue, um, what is it called? Delete, no, remove, remove all. Now my queue is empty. But where do we see queue status? The queue is empty. And now it will write 10 things to the queue. There's some output. So I show the REPL. The REPL, exactly, I have experimenting that before. So if I run now this, it will always write the, the YAML, the parameter file, and queue an experiment with that. And, and DVC will remember all that. It takes a bit because it really runs this DVC uh, a queue command, which yeah, is not immediate. So to do that for 10,000, even the queuing of the thing would take a few hours. But now I have a queue of 10 runs, and I can run them uh, in one go overnight before I go to bed. You, uh, I don't remember the name, run all or something it's called. No, it's not Q, sorry. DVC, exp, run, and then something. Uh, run all. DVC, exp, run, run all. I can even split that in, an, in, in uh, a certain number of things to be run at the same time. Let's maybe do that for fun. Do we need a lot of memory here? I don't know. It will probably work to do it in two things. So now it runs these things in in the background. Ah, uh, something's not working. I don't know why. Uh, anyway, it tried to run. What is there? No such file of directory. Yeah, I don't know. It should have worked. It, it should it, it it should now try to run these ten things in the background, which apparently it does, but something didn't work. File of directory, DVC, temp. There's something with these plots directory which it doesn't like. Maybe there's some what it could be, if you see status, I don't know. I have no idea why this is failing. So I tried at least to run these 10 times, uh, but they all failed. So if I now look at my the status of my queue, um, it says probably 10 failed runs, yes. I have no idea why. <laughs> Oh, that's a really nice trick. That's a really nice trick, though, um, yes. kind of loading the queue yeah. from uh, closure like that. Yeah. Exactly, 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 exactly. Yeah. Um, maybe we can take a brief pause just for a second, just to yeah. wrap up. We can um, certainly stay on and chat. And uh, yeah, just but I'm done with my, there were the things I wanted to say. That's fine. Yeah, it's fine for me. Yeah. So I try to get it yeah. working. Maybe. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, uh, so I know we're a few minutes over here. So, um, of course. Yeah. Everyone's welcome to stay uh, as long as you all like. We often will stick around for um, you know a very long time <laughs> and uh, just chit chat and explore things. And maybe we can uh, help Carson figure out what's going on here. But just in case <laughs> you go um, or had uh, other plans after the scheduled time, um, we can give everyone a chance. Maybe take like a little one or two minute break and then uh, reconvene. I don't know if that makes sense. What do you guys think? Um, and then anyone who, uh, who has to still have some time, so I can stay. Uh, I can stay a bit longer. Yeah, cool. I would definitely. Yeah, I would love to stick around and and uh, explore this. This is really cool. So so thanks so much for this. And I guess for anyone watching this um, later, all of this. Uh, I was in the wrong directory. I was in the wrong directory. Oh, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it was just that there was someone in the wrong directory, which. It's the curse of a uh, live. Yeah, 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 yeah. When everybody's yeah, watching it's it is, impossible it <laughs> exactly properly um but yeah all of the stuff we've talked about will be like usually we'll post a summary of the these meetings on the somewhere on the site closure website um probably on the closure verse uh event would be one place to check we'll like leave a comment or something where you can find uh the recording of this and whatever other resources we talked about or used um and yeah, if uh, yeah, we'll see. Okay, bye, Ian. Thanks so much for joining us. Um, yeah, this was exciting. So, 
Well, uh, I might just pop away for about 30 seconds, um, but I'll be back and anyone else is welcome to stick around as well. And uh, yeah, we can explore this a little bit more. So thanks so much for Carson and Santiago.